My name is Amy, project manager with Bilingual Montessori, and I'm going to share with you a short summary about Bilingual Montessori. If you haven't heard it yet, I think we have a lot of new people here that haven't come to our community conversations before. So it all began when our founding partners kept hearing about the struggles and discussions and questions that people were having about how to best integrate bilingual education into Montessori schools effectively. In this photo here, you will see, uh, this is the open space session from the LEAD Montessori Conference in Prague in 2019. And this was one of those heartfelt discussions and what we feel is the origin of bilingual Montessori. After this, the founding partners organized themselves, applied for, and received a three-year grant from Erasmus Plus to support our project. And Bilingual Montessori was officially launched, launched in February of 2022. So early on, it was decided that our approach to this challenge would be, would come from the whole school perspective, meaning that we will focus the work with specific, the specific needs of the different groupings that make up a school, namely the Montessori guides, the language specialists, and the school leaders. And keeping those groupings in mind, we are developing the grant outcomes in three different areas. First, we have the field guide, which we now officially call the field guide for building bilingual programs for elementary schools. This guide, which we are currently working on, is developing to be very rich with effective classroom and administrative practices. We've also included information from language experts to help you better understand second language acquisition and development. Next, we're producing a three-level online training course based on this field guide. And the three levels means it's designed for Montessori guides, language specialists, and school leaders. Here we will be offering this for those wanting to build or improve a bilingual Montessori school with support from our project, as well as being able to be part of the community of the course to learn together. The last outcome we set to accomplish is to build this community for all of us to engage, practice, support, and relate to each other. And we've done this through our community conversations, our online social media groups, and our website at bilingualmontessori.com, as well as open dialogue that we have had with so many of you that have reached out to share your experiences. Here is a picture of our team. And if you don't know us already, you can go to our website to learn more about each of us. And we always ask that you keep in touch with us via our website and social media because your involvement is a very important part of this journey. So let us know your needs, your ideas, your feedback on the project. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website to learn about future events. And from there, you can email us also at hello at bilingualmontessori.com. We are always very happy to hear from you. And now I'll pass my word to Mary Kay and she will share a project update with you. Yes, so what we like to do is just take a few minutes and update you on the work of our current grant, which is called um, Building Elementary Programs in Montessori Schools. Um, and some of you who receive our newsletter will be aware that we recently, last week, turned in an application for another Erasmus grant. And since I had asked um, people to contribute their thoughts via a questionnaire, I wanted to sh share with you now what we what the proposal was in the proposal. Um, there were three main objectives, and the first objective is to create a network of what we're calling language aware bilingual schools, or the acronym LABS. Um, we will create a labs alignment 
alignment criteria handbook, essentially the guidelines, the standards for what is necessary to be considered part of this network, um, focusing on learning environments, intercultural competence, and making sure that we always involve everyone in our community. And the message that we're all learning languages, we think is fundamental. The second objective was to create um, re regional labs hubs. The idea is that, um, as we know, we have lots in common, many things are universal, but then there are specific realities due to legislation, national curriculums, languages themselves, local languages, um, which affect how we design and implement our second language or third language programs. So we felt like it would be helpful to create um, regional um, hubs so that this some of this information can be um, that it can be adapted to the regional context and also then shared more to create a system that's more um, agile in sharing um, among local networks. Um, and so yeah, we want to have local learning centers and to um, make sure that we're sharing not just in our our familiar networks, which is for us our Montessori networks. We also feel it's very important to reach out and include other bilingual educators or multilingual educators and experts in our network. So we get that cross fertilization, which we believe will make everyone's work much richer. And then the third objective was is focused on um, additional digital resources, um, which we've gained experience creating in during this first grant. And we want to target um, professionals and especially professionals maybe that are earlier in their career in, in teaching in a, in a bilingual school or with more than one language and for family for families because what we've realized is that that basic information for both groups is the same um obviously there'll be different focuses but like just the baseline information that that we all need um is the same and we feel that it's really crucial that as to much as we can do to make sure that professionals and um, parents have the same information, so there's also more coherence between home and school. Um, so that was our third objective, and we will find out probably in six months or so if we got the grant, we'll let you know. And um, in the meantime, we're just going to keep working hard to um, finalize the the um, the deliverables for for this grant, which is the field guide, which Amy mentioned before, and a companion course, which goes with the field online companion course, which goes with the field guide. So you'll be hearing more about those in coming weeks and months. Thank you, Amy. Um, so now we'd like to turn to today's guest. Um, Jana Winnefeld. Is that right, Jana? That's right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So lovely and to see all of you. Jana is um, a very passionate, enthusiastic person in general, um, and, and really passionate about the things that she knows that she really cares about and that she knows a lot about. And one of those things is um, learner autonomy, applying um, ideas of learner autonomy in the classroom. Um, Jana works at the Montessori Cap Campus Dietschenbach, close to Frankfurt, and she teaches English as a foreign language in Montessori classrooms for children aged six to 10. She's trained as a six to 12 Montessori guide and in the past, she's worked um, at the University of Hildensheim and conducted research on task-based language teaching in a Montessori environment. 
Um, and not as if that's not enough, she also has is involved with two colleagues. Um, they developed a module for foreign language learning in the German Montessori training um, course. And so now there's a separate model, a module, sorry, um, that they, they've included. And I think you've done it once. Is that right, Jana? Yeah, we piloted last year. And this year we had the first real run of mm -hmm. this, this module within the Montessori training. Mm -hmm. right. So this is really helpful and this hopefully what they're learning we can the rest of us can learn from and create modules to go into other training courses. Um, Jana, um, her passion is with combining Montessori, learning autonomy, and what we know about L2 acquisition. Um, she also loves elephants, yoga, and English children's books. So you get a sense of the whole person that is mm -hmm. young. So we're very happy to have her here because um, learner autonomy is obviously a concept that's very friendly to Montessori theories and practices. Um, and but it was developed separately as it came from the, lang the from language teachers who developed new strategies for working with um, initially older students um, and then have gone down through elementary. Um, and well, I'll, I won't say more, I'll let Jana <laughs> tell us um, her experience. And that's essentially what she wanted to share was this, how she, her process, what she's gone through once she learned about this, and then how she's been applying it in trial and error in her work with the children in, in schools. So thank you very much, Jana. And I well, thank, you. thank you for this lovely introduction, Mary Kay. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Do I take over now? Yes. Huh? Yes. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm really, really happy to have you here. Um, before I start with my talk, I would love to know what your prior knowledge is about language learner autonomy. Mm -hmm. So we've prepared a mentee, All right? So it's pretty equal, a little bit more, yes. <laughs> so you have some some prior knowledge right here. If you don't, don't worry about it. You're, you're perfect here. And if you do, then you get some insight of how you could put that into practice in the classroom. So both of you will benefit today for sure. It's just so interesting because all of us are trying our best, right, to include a foreign language in Montessori. So and we know that, like, to make choices is something that is that is part of, of Montessori education. And, yeah, so some of you already imp imply that or include that in your teaching and some of you um, not yet. And that's totally fine as well. The topic of today is one that is very, very close to my Montessori guide heart and one that's very, very close to my researcher heart and my, um, what did I forget now? Montessori guide researcher and foreign language teacher heart. Yes, <laughs> like all three are so important for me. And so I would like to share with you today how you can take steps with your kids in your classroom um, towards language learner autonomy. So how you can help kids to develop autonomy in their foreign language in your classroom. Before I tell you what I would like to share today, I would quickly like to take you into a Montessori classroom. For those of you who have been to a Montessori environment, I guess most of us have been, and um, you will have seen that children become increasingly independent or autonomous in all subject areas. And the first time I went to such an environment, to be honest, it gave me goosebumps because I was amazed at what the kids were able to do, how busy and focused they were and how they followed their own agenda and work. In Paula Park Lillard's words, there was a full busy feel to the classroom. There was work everywhere, intent busy, level of work staggering, independence, and no obvious directing by the adults, but no one in the room in this time at least is idle. And this, seeing this in a classroom, it just astounded me. I was amazed to see these kids so capable and also it changed my view of what school could be like, what my role as a teacher is and what the role of the child is. And coming from the background of being a foreign language teacher, I was thinking, so how do we offer foreign language in that environment? How could they be autonomous in that? 
because in the environment where I observed, there was no foreign language teaching right there, or I didn't see it then. So how can L2 learning take place in the Montessori environment so that the Montessori principles still apply, but also what we know about L2 acquisition? What we ultimately want, we want confident kids, we want competent kids, we want them to be autonomous, not only in general, but also in the foreign language when they learn it and when they acquire it. But we know, and you're here because of that, because Maria Montessori never developed such an approach. And because L2 learning is not part of most training of becoming a Montessori teacher yet, but still we know that acquiring a foreign language is vital in today's world. And Montessori has so much to offer, autonomy has so much to offer also for the L2. So fast forward a couple of years, or actually many years, <laughs> I'm in my class with one of my classrooms where I work, and we had just done an activity in the L2 together in the classroom with a small group of children. And then afterwards, they each chose their follow-up work. And within a short period of time, they were all busily engaged in their individual work. Now, when you look at the picture, of course, this is not Montessori and this is not elementary, right? <laughs> but it gives you a feeling of how focused the kids were. So imagine there was one boy sitting on the floor. He had picked up a book we had read months before and he wanted to read it to himself. And months ago, he had struggled to read it. And now he had picked it up and he was reading it to himself. Next to him, there was another boy. He had chosen to draw a part of the story and to write a couple of sentences about it. And a couple of meters away, there were two boys who were sitting there were just talking about a game that produced in the foreign language with each other. And then looking around, I saw two girls sitting at a table and they were both working on their Christmas break. And one had created a small pocketbook and the other girl had created a bigger page about um, yeah, their Christmas break and they, draw, they drew and they wrote about it. And they all had picked this work by themselves. So I looked around the classroom and these kids were sitting in the middle of everyone else who was working on their end on their individual work in math biology and all kinds of subjects and when I when I was there at the beginning in a normal in a, in a Montessori environment I didn't know how it could work and then I was right here experiencing my kids being so autonomous and I was so proud of them how did we get here? How did I get here? How did the kids get here? It has been a journey for me as a researcher and teacher, and it has been a journey for the kids to learn to become autonomous. For me, it has been a journey of 18 years. I started off working, I started off working at university and I took my first few steps. Yeah, yeah. All right. I took my first theoretical steps, then I became a teacher and I took my first steps as a teacher and then I became more brave and I tried to include autonomy in the classroom more and more. So what I would like to do today is to share this journey with you. I would like to share it and to share some learning, some tools that I met and that I applied along the way and how it worked. And hopefully you get to take something with you that you could put into practice in your classroom. And maybe I share something where you say, oh, I'm already doing that. And that's so beautiful if you do, because as I said before, we are all, I didn't say that, but <laughs> I was thinking that um, we're all pioneers in this, right? We're trying to use what we feel so passionate about Montessori and to include a foreign language in that. And the question is, how do we do that? And so we are all on this journey together. And I look forward to your questions, to your remarks at the end. And yeah, so let's get on this journey. Um, I started off with my first theoretical steps, as I said, um, asking myself the question, how could Montessori and L2 learning be united? And I looked at all kinds of second language acquisition theories, SLA research and um, foreign language approaches, and I reflected. And then I went and observed in America, in, in Germany, in Switzerland, in Canada, to figure out how does Montessori work? What are the principles? And how do they offer a foreign language? And that led me to conduct my own research in a bilingual Montessori setting as well. And based on all of that, I made certain decisions of what I believe is important when we include a foreign language in Montessori. And one of them is that the L2 primarily takes place in the classroom. Every other part of cosmic education of Montessori education takes place in the classroom, unless the project or the task asks us to leave the environment to do research in nature or to maybe conduct research outside to do an interview when you do, and then you do a going out when you want to interview somebody outside the classroom. But other than that, 
learning and exploring in Montessori mostly takes place in the classroom. Um, so the L2 also needs to be present in the classroom to start from there. Of course, we can venture out of the classroom, but that is where the L2 needs to take place. Now you might wonder, why am I even saying that? Because when I went to observe at different Montessori schools, sometimes that would happen, that the kids would be taken out of the classroom twice for 45 minutes or once a week for 90 minutes. And then they would go back to the classroom and they wouldn't use the foreign language anymore for the rest of the week. And why do I feel that the foreign language should be in the classroom? Why is it important? Because then the L2 is always available. There is no end and beginning of learning in L2. It is an imminent part of the environment then. So a child can at any time choose to work with the L2. It also has a motivational factor because when you as a child see another child working on an L2 project, you might say, oh man, that looks interesting. I would love to do that too. I would like to give an example. This happened last month. This is an example of a six-year-old. I was just working in a Montessori environment. Everyone else, every or all of the children were working on their own work. And all at once, this girl was standing in front of me and saying to me, Miss Winifred, can ich auch ein Ketchup on your conflicts book machen? So she was asking me, asking me, can I also make a Ketchup on your conflicts book? Now we're in February, but we read the book in October or November, Ketchup on your conflicts. And there are phrases in there like, do you like ketchup on your conflicts? Do you like salt on your conflicts? It's a flat book. So you have a different top and a bottom and it makes funny questions. And I'd offered back then to the kids that they could make their own ketchup on your conflicts books, book. And this girl had witnessed other kids making this book. And now she felt she was ready. So here she is with a book and she's making her own book about ketchup on your conflicts. She picks the sentences and the words that she would like to use. And I was just sitting across from her also, um, just preparing a lesson for a small group of kids in the foreign language. And then she was, she stood up and she was standing in front of me and said to me, Miss Winifred, milk is milk of English. So milk is milk in English. And she went back to her work and five minutes later, she would come up to me and she would say, Miss Winifred, I is egg of English. So I is egg in English. So here she was just sharing with me what she had learned just by herself. So when you include the foreign language in the classroom, you give, some, you give a child the opportunity to be surrounded by the foreign language, to see other kids working with it, and at some point to choose to want to do it yourself, and then to choose also what words you would like to learn. So that was my choice number one. Choice number two was that you as an L2 guide speak mostly in the L2. If you think about what communication is, it's uh, not communication, language is, it's a means of communication. A foreign language is a means of communication. So kids should also experience it as just that, as an authentic means that is embedded in everyday conversation. It should be authentic language input, meaning they hear the language in, authentic, in an authentic context. When you are confronted with a foreign language, you can only understand the foreign language if it is embedded in the here and now, if it is contextualized. So it helps the kids to understand when you give a context, but also when you use gestures and visuals. So when I talk to my kids, especially to the younger ones, I will use gestures and visuals. So if I would like to ask the kids to please go get a pair of scissors, I don't just say the words, I say, okay, please go get a pair of scissors, yeah, go, get a pair of scissors, go, go. So I would repeat the, the movements and, um, and use gestures and visuals um, to just support that understanding of the kids. And because I would do that every time, at some point they might understand me without me using those gestures and visuals anymore. Understanding increases. And at some point they might just start to produce language themselves individual words or chunks of language they might have heard from me um, when they interacted with me. But that is up to the child when he or she is ready to do that right then. So, okay, um, the L2 needs to take place in the Montessori environment. The L2 guide speaks the foreign language. Um, well, there's one remark I wanted to say. The reason why I bring that up as well is because when I went to a public school, I observed also at public schools, sometimes the teachers would not do that. They would not use the foreign language when interacting with the kids, but only when they did a 
activities with them, but it just offers so much learning opportunities to them. So why not do everything in English? Why not do bilingual Montessori? Why not do an immersive classroom? Um, I have not conducted a study on this, but I, I went to different schools and the thing that I observed in immersive or bilingual Montessori settings is in these settings, the kids would mostly only use the L2 when communicating with a teacher and not much when they communicated with each other. Nevertheless, we know that in order for a foreign language to develop, you need speech production, you need interaction. Kids need to speak and to write. They need opportunities for that in the L2. Because what happens when you produce language is you need to think about how you say something instead of only trying to understand. So if you try to say something, you think about what words do I need to use? Okay, how do I put them together? How do I pronounce the words? Okay, does everything that I just put together, does it still um, express what I actually want to say? It's quite a complex process to, to say something in the foreign language instead of just trying to understand what is happening and where you only use your pragmatic competence. What happens when you produce language is you notice what you can't say yet. You might have experienced that before when you try to produce a foreign language. You might have experienced that, oh, I'm trying to say that. I don't know how to say that. And then maybe you think, oh, let's try this out. Maybe I could say it like this. So was it two weeks ago, one of, one of my kids in the classroom said, do you are happy? Now she'd heard the question, do you like ketchup on your cornflakes? So she used that and then she used the form of to be, are, and she tried it out. Maybe it would work, right? And then if this child interacts with another child or with me, this child might get feedback. And maybe we need to negotiate for meaning. Maybe I need to ask, what do you mean? Um, in my research, there was one child who said, is it to the left, is it to the left or to the lie? And then the partner would ask, what? And then the child would self-correct and say, is it to the left or to the right? <laughs> right? So these moments of interaction just offer learning opportunities, either, yeah, in, in many different ways. I can't go into detail right now, but I got, I've got lots of examples in my own research of that. So it is important that the children produce and interact in the foreign language because that is where language learn autonomy, uh, language learn autonomy, language development happens. So we need to offer a variety of production opportunities to the kids and not just to respond to the teacher. Because when do you ever initiate an interaction? When do you ever invite somebody or negotiate for meaning if you only talk to the teacher? We need to offer a variety of opportunities. Maybe we could do a task like this. Um, where the kids interview each other. So this is Cora's work. She is a fourth grader, so she's nine years old, and she um, yeah, can ask other kids, what's your favorite and my favorite is? And she picked that she wanted to ask about city, sport, color, weather, animal, and food. And so she would ask wherever she would want to ask. Now, why did I provide the language here? Because we had just started to work on this. And she was just starting to learn the foreign language as well. Later on, of course, you could also give them a survey that doesn't provide the language. So let's say it's about Christmas. Could be a survey about Christmas. So maybe a child might say, I would like to know from my classmates if they believe in Santa. So maybe this child will then want to say, do you believe in Santa? Or do you have a Christmas tree? Or who do you celebrate Christmas with? with? Or what's your favorite Christmas song? So maybe a child would like to do the survey, but then realize I don't know how to say these things and then need to figure out how and then do the survey. What it needs from you as an L2 guide is that you initiate and offer and engage the children in such opportunities for producing and interacting the L2, like with such a task that I just showed. But of course, a child cannot just do that task. You need to help the child to be prepared for it. So you do something with a child before they're able to do it themselves. Um, especially with beginner learners, I would hear Montessori guides ask me, how do I get children to produce language? And especially with young children, age six to nine, um, they have little to no L2 speaking skills here in Germany, um, or nor can they read and write in the L2 yet. So you can't just say, let's just start. 
there needs to be a preparation as well. So what could that look like? For free L2 production, free language production, it needs at the very beginning input, input, input. Yes, from the teacher, the interaction with the teacher, but also it needs activities together based on input. So just to give you an example, you could do a rhyme with them. This is taken from, I think her name is Sarah Phillips. I'm big, I'm small, I'm short, I'm tall. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm good, I'm bad. We're friends, that's the end. Maybe you do such a rhyme with them and they act it out. And then um, that is kind of the nutrition of the tree, the input. But to get to the crown to the tree, free language production, you need the roots and the trunk to get there. So what are the roots? The roots are reproduction. So it's not free language production right there. It's reproduction of the things that they learn. So they could reproduce the rhyme. And the girl that I showed to you earlier with a catch up on your conflicts, um, last week when I was at lunch, she came up to me and she said, Miss Winnefeld, I already know the poem by heart. And she would recite it to me. She didn't have to do that, but she chose to. That is the roots. And then from the roots, you go to partly free L2 production. So that could be a survey with given phrases like the what's your favorite survey, where they are added challenges and they, they get to choose what to ask. And then from there, you go up to free L2 production, where there are no given phrases in a survey or a picture description task where one child will describe a picture to another child and the other child needs to draw the picture, but he or she cannot see the original picture. Or up there, you have something called a two minute talk, um, which is taken from the pioneer and learn autonomy, Lini Dam, um, which just asks the kids to talk in the foreign language for two minutes about anything they want and just see, can you do that? But in order, as I said, to get there, you need to build it up from the roots and to give nutrition input, input, input all the time. So I learned about all of that. And then I took my first steps as a teacher in the classroom. And I was excited to try out everything I'd learned, heard, and read about and had conducted research on. So I would go into the classroom as an L2 teacher. Um, and I would do lessons with small groups of kids. And then they would do such a follow-up task like the survey. And there was a shelf with L2 materials in the classroom. So the kids were able to work with it while I was not there. And what I would see is that they enjoyed learning. They were not afraid to learn the foreign language. They made some progress. But there were things missing. What was lacking? From a Montessori standpoint, where was their freedom of choice? I would do a lesson with them and then they would have to do the task that I offered to them. They could just pick and choose when to do it. That's not a lot of freedom of choice, right? Where was their self-expression? Maybe a little bit in the survey to ask, to think about what would I like to ask? What's your favorite? But what about big projects? Elementary school kids are so, yeah, it's so big for them to work on big projects. Um, and from an SLA, second language acquisition standpoint, I had the roots and the trunk figured out, but not the crown of the tree yet. I didn't have a lot of free language production to push the learners to produce the L2 from the start. And from a psychological and motivational standpoint, there could be more autonomy. But to be honest, I had no idea yet what that could entail. So working in that environment, I felt like I needed to learn I needed to go to conferences, to teacher trainings, and I would learn from researchers and practitioners. And somehow I came across a reappearing approach, language learn autonomy. So what is that? What is that language learn autonomy? It is a readiness of the learner to take charge of one's own learning and the service of, of his or her own needs and purposes. So a child sets his own aims what to do and how to do it, and becomes increasingly independent in the L2. A child will plan his or her own projects, and that means that the child needs to be capable and willing to act independently and in cooperation with others. It also means that you as a teacher must be willing to let go so that the learners can take over. It's a very child process and product oriented approach. Language learn autonomy also asks the kids to produce or not, not produce, well, produce and, and understand the foreign language from the beginning. It's authentic L2 use, L2 use from the start. The kids get to choose freely and are empowered from the start. 
There's a focus on cooperation communication. There's a focus on self-expression and language learning autonomy. And there's a focus on multiple skills, which is not just L2 related. Let's give you, I would like to give you an example. Now this is taken from a colleague of mine. Um, she did an activity or a task with the kids where they had to present their hometown. They were supposed to make a video about their hometown. Now there was a girl who was really, really good at playing the guitar. So she decided to write a song about her hometown. And I would, yeah, and then she would make a video of that. So what would happen in such a task to present your hometown as natural differentiation because these kids get to choose what would I like to express? How would I like to show myself? I get to bring um, a skill that I maybe already know like playing the guitar, but I don't have to. How could I present? And I can choose content. I can choose language that I would like to include in such a, a big project. So I heard all about that and I saw that there was a similarity of principles between language learning autonomy and Montessori. And it was possible to integrate it in what I had developed so far. And also it offered an opportunity to help learners develop autonomy and independence in the L2. So I was ready to put it into practice and take my next steps in language learning autonomy. And the interesting thing was, is that I had never seen or experienced a language learner environment before. And so I was a little bit skeptical and could not really imagine how that would work, even though I participated in more than one teacher training with Leni Dunn, the pioneer in language learner autonomy, who has decades of experience in this. But I was like, okay, could that work? I'm not really sure. Nevertheless, I dare to take my first steps, those that seemed less daunting to me. So what did I dare to do at the beginning? Instead of offering only one option at the end, after I would do a lesson or a small activity with the kids, I would then say, okay, you could do this, this or that. Give them three or more options. So when we think about Christmas, it could be you could make a little pocketbook about your Christmas break, you could design a page about it, or you could maybe create a game about it. Or I would give them one task but they would have the freedom to choose of how to do it, like when they present their hometown, so get to choose what content and what language to take in it. And what happened in my classroom was there was an increase in motivation. Instead of hearing what I would sometimes hear, do I have to do this? I would rather hear things like, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this. Why? Because they felt that their choice and what they wanted mattered. So of course that would increase their motivation. So I thought, how could I give them more freedom? Instead of just telling them you could do this, this or that, I would ask the question, what else could you do? So every time after um, I would do a lesson or an activity with them, I would offer choices. You could do these three things. And because I would do that every time, it would slowly build up a repertoire of follow-up activities that the kids could choose from. And we would collect them on a poster. This idea is also taken from Lini Dunn. This is not my own. And so the activities, the lists would grow over time. And so the kids would know what to do and that would help them to have their own ideas. And of course, what it needs is, is that you as a guide need to be open for the children's suggestions. And you need to help and support them sometimes to make choices. So there was more freedom of choice in my classroom now, but there could even be more autonomy. Um, so, and that was the question, what would you like to learn? What words and language structures would you like to learn in the foreign language? And this idea is also taken from Leni Dunn. So that the kids would then create a game with the words and language items they would like to learn. And that was very meaningful to them because they would choose and learn what they would like to express and what would become part of their game. And that was based on their interest with regard to content and language. And then this game would become part of the prepared environment. So they would be able to play each other's games. Now, what happens here is there is some, self, some sense of self-expression, right? I get to choose what I would like to learn, learn autonomy, and also the experience of being competent because I created my own game as a child, right? And I get to be a teacher for somebody else because maybe um, 
you would like to play my game or I would like to play my game with you. And then I get to teach you the words that I learned. This is an example of such a pairs game. This is a third grader, so he's eight years old and he has just started to learn the foreign language. I would provide, this is also taken from Lini Dum, the idea, I would provide a magazine, magazines to them and a template for a memory game and dictionaries. And then they would pick and choose what words they would like to learn. So what do you think are his interests when you look at these pictures? You see a vacuum cleaner, see a hedge trimmer, you see a train, you see an hourglass and a car, binoculars. Yeah, he's really into technology and he's into tools. That is what he's interested in. And if somebody had told me while I was studying to become a foreign language teacher, that those would be the first words of a child learning a foreign language, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> but this was his language. He wanted to learn these words. And the other thing that happened was I gave them a template of six pairs. Now, if you look at his memory game right here, he went beyond that because he, he wanted to keep on learning. And I have kids who've created now a stack of cards. They keep on producing and producing. And two or three weeks ago, I sat down with six and seven year olds and or seven year olds. And I wanted to look at the stack of game of, of their game because I thought, okay, I leave the classroom. I don't actually see when they when they play it or when they work with it. I would like to know if do they actually know these words that they have looked up and that they had learned. So they I sat down with them and they laid out their cards and they were so excited to show me. And then they would read them to me. And they were able to. Of course, there were some pronunciation errors, but hey, they had learned these words. It was incredible. And yeah, it's just beautiful to see um, how they produce their games and then how they play these games and how it's become a part of their environment and of what they learn with. Now, on the original game, you saw there were only words. Now, this is a game from a nine-year-old girl. Last summer, I asked them to prepare a game about their summer break. And she was not happy with only doing individual words. She wanted to talk about her summer break. So she wanted to be able to express, I went paragliding with Andy. We crafted, I have got air tracks. Did she know how to say that before she started that game? Not all of that, no. She had to ask for it. She asked me, she asked the Montessori guide, she would look things up in the dictionary, and then that would become her game. So what happens in this is there's natural differentiation again, because if you only feel happy with or ready to include individual words, go ahead and do that. If you would like to express more, that's part of that as well. A prepared environment for this needs dictionaries, picture dictionaries, magazines and crafting material, and then the Paris, gay temp Paris game template. And it also needs a close cooperation between the L2 guide and the Montessori guide. Because as I said, I go into the classroom and I leave and the kids keep on producing these games or keep on working with a task. So the Montessori guide needs to know what is happening. She needs to know how she can support when the kids need help. Because they're not fully autonomous yet, right? They need support sometimes. So we need to cooperate and communicate a lot with each other. Um, and then I saw these big projects at a conference, not only the small ones like these memory games, but presenting their hometown and a tutorial video that Annika Albrecht, a Montessori guide and Carmen Becker, a professor and researcher in foreign languages here in Germany, um, presented at a conference and had um, done projects with teenagers and children where they would truly express themselves. Okay, you can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, wonderful. So I would see these projects, these videos, and I thought, oh my word, these teenagers are so capable. I want to try that out with my kids, with my eight, nine, and 10-year-olds. Why don't I, why can't I move my presentation? Okay, 
yeah, I wanted to do these bigger projects for self-expression. So I took one of the projects from these two, Annika Albrecht and Carmen Becker, which is a video project, which is called 25 Facts About Me. That means that the kids get to present themselves. Um, they get to present themselves with a certain number of facts. It's called 25 facts, but they can also only do 10. I tell them you can do more than 10 facts, 10 or more facts. And when I did that for the first time a couple of years ago, there was one girl in particular that's in my mind who said, I don't want to do a video. She didn't feel say, sure. She didn't feel that maybe she didn't feel that she was capable and she was shy. But then fast forward three weeks, four weeks, and I would see her video. And it just amazed me because she was sitting there all proud, holding up her ballerina, saying that she likes to do ballet. Or she would say, I love baking cakes. And she would hold up a carrot cake she had baked into the camera. Or she would show her cats. And I could see that she's, she was so happy. She was motivated. She enjoyed doing it. And when we watched the video together with our English group, with our small group where, who, who was doing this project, I could see that she was so proud of herself. And when you looked at the phrases that she used in the video, those were not mine that I taught her. Those were the ones that she chose to learn herself because she wanted to talk about herself. And we're actually doing this project right now again with my eight, nine and 10 year olds. And what is happening is just incredible because I come into the classroom and then the first thing I hear sometimes is, okay, what's the next step in the project? Because I've already finished this. I'm so happy because we're working on the project. Or another girl would say, I'm so excited because I get to talk in front of the camera. Or another boy comes up to me and he says, I'm already finished with the project or I've learned my facts by heart. Like, it's so interesting because they're so motivated. And the momentum that has taken place right there is incredible. A colleague of mine also says she's doing the project together with me that it's unbelievable because these kids get to express themselves all at once. The topic has to do with them. They feel seen, they're part of a group. They can bring themselves and their own skills and interests and they're so proud of their product. Just yesterday, um, I was with a small group of kids, always three kids together, and they would videotape themselves. One would be in charge of the camera, one would be in charge of counting down. So when the camera would have to start, when the child would have to start speaking, and one would then hold up her pictures or his pictures and present him or herself. And they would work in these small groups and I'd be stand there and think, okay, go ahead. It's not mine anymore, this has become yours. And then at some point they come up to me and they say they're finished. It's so beautiful to watch. So there's more self-expression, big projects, more L2 production from the start. And that because they are pushed to produce L2 from the start and there's more autonomy. And what it needs in the environment is of course, technical devices. And the kids need to have some level of L2 skills and confidence. Yet, I can't just ask them to do such a project if they're just starting to, right? And they also need to be prepared for. So also, according to the tree that I shared earlier, but also before you do such a video, if you feel like they're ready for it, you need to ask the question, what do the children need to be able to perform the target task, like making such a, such a video about yourself? What activities and language support do the children need to get there? And Annika Albrecht and Carmen Becker, who came up with a project 25 facts about me, um, present in their publication input, output, meaning speech production and written production and interactive activities that you could do to prepare them for it. So this book is in German, um, but the, the material is in English. So I can highly recommend it because as I said, it's beautiful to do these projects with your kids in the classroom. Now, of course, we don't start with these big projects in the classroom. Um, as I said earlier, when you have those six to nine year olds who have little to no speaking skills in the foreign language yet, nor can they read and write in the L2 yet, the methodology needs to develop over time. At the beginning, there's more input time, there's more time with a teacher and it decreases over time. Also, we don't start with free L2 production, but it gets more over time, autonomy increases and we move from small projects to bigger projects. 
And another thing that is vital in learn autonomy is documentation evaluation. So while the kids work on these projects, they plan, they carry out the plan, and then they evaluate and they make new plans. So after this 25 fact project, we're gonna sit down and they're gonna evaluate how it went, what they learned, what was hard, what they are proud of and what their next step would be. Um, yeah. So what is part of that L2 learn autonomy environment in Montessori now, as I shared. The L2 primarily takes place in the classroom. The L2 guide speaks the L2, everyday language supported by visuals and gestures. There's a variety of opportunities for, for L2 production and interaction orally and written. And you do lessons and activities to prepare the kids to produce the foreign language in the tree, right? You need the roots, the trunk and to get there. And then there are follow-up tasks where the kids can choose and suggest their own work that they could do. Then there are umbrella tasks. Umbrella task means it's a task where everyone can work on his or her own level. Um, so we start with those small projects like making a game where the kids could choose what they would like to learn. And we have those bigger umbrella tasks that pro those projects of self-expression like the video project. And then they always document and evaluate, of course, when they're ready to read and to write with the help of logbooks and posters. And what we also do is whole class activities because input is so important. So we do games, storytelling songs together and for input and L2 reproduction. And then when I meet with a small group of kids, I always have a ritual that includes free L2 production at the beginning. I don't do that when they start learning the foreign language, but when I feel they're ready, we start with small little activities where free L2 production happens. So my journey has taken me from theoretical steps to my first steps as a teacher, to becoming more brave and to taking more steps towards learn autonomy in the classroom. And now I see these kids, as I shared at the beginning, working independently, choosing their own work. And I see the motivation in them, but still we're not done. We keep on developing. We plan, we try out, we evaluate and take the next steps. What Lini Dam, the pioneer in Learn Autonomy says, the classroom is a workshop, it is not an artificial environment. It's a workshop or a laboratory where things are being tried out and investigated by both teachers and learners. So both the kids and I, we plan, we do, we evaluate, we take step by step so that autonomous learning keeps on developing. A journey of a thousand steps starts with one single step. That's a saying that I encountered at one of my first conferences or workshops that I went to that was about learn autonomy. Learn autonomy cannot happen from one day to the next. Essentially, it is a matter of getting started, of taking first small steps towards creating a learning environment where learners are encouraged to make decisions concerning their own learning and where the teacher dares to let go and where evaluation becomes an integral part of the course, where the teacher dares to let go. And you remember what my first step was to dare to let go. It was only offering the kids three different options. You could do this, this, or that after I'd done a small activity with them. And I would try that out and see that it worked. And then I would take the next step and try it out and see if it works and take the next step. And many, many steps later, now I find myself in the classroom seeing these moments where the kids are engaged in their own individual work they have chosen or when a, the small girl, the six-year-old comes up to me and wants to do the catch up on your conflicts book and she learns her words or the kids working with their memory games and they learn those words themselves. And they, yesterday, well, there was a group of kids who laid out all their memory cards on their racks and they were so excited and they kept laying them out, they wanted to play a huge game. And I see their excitement and their motivation. Or in the 25 Fact Project, I see some kids who really struggle with a language, who don't dare to. And at some point it makes click, something changes in them. And then you see them come into their power and you see how they are motivated, how they um, become more and more autonomous, how they become more and more confident, how they acquire the language step by step, and how those language skills develop. And for me, it's just beautiful to watch. I'm just so happy 
to get to be on this learn autonomy journey with these kids and that we can keep on developing this learn autonomy. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you so much for listening. And I would love to hear your comments. I would love to hear your questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for giving me this time. I'm going to stop sharing, I guess, right? Right now. Yeah, and now we can yes. look and see what questions people have put into the chat um, while you were talking. Yes. And... Um, but yeah, that was that was really amazing. You really covered, I thought, so many aspects and from so many different points of view. Um, very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm just having a quick look at the chat and um while you're looking at the, at the chat, maybe I can share something as well. You know, I always have my theoretical mind. I always think about what are the theories? What does SLA say? And that's the glasses that I have on when I go into the classroom. And when I try out Learn Autonomy and I use those memory games with the kids, for example, I get to see these things and I get to see how they play out in practice. And I think, oh, that's what they mean in theory. Okay. It's really, really cool how it comes together. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll read this question. Um, yes. If there is a L2 teacher, how does he, she communicate with the children during real life situations, planning, conflicts, projects, going out? If they are the whole day with the children, shall the children get the presentations in their native language first and then in an L2? So this is really more about how you implement um, a program with more than one language, the mm -hmm. mechanics of it. Um, yeah. Is there a separate shelf for the L2? Do you want to yes. answer those questions? Yes, I have a shelf for the L2, but I know that our kids at our school, they have early French and early Spanish. So some material on the English shelf is also, there's also a dictionary for French in there. So it depends on what is needed in the environment. Um, so that's the shelf. Um, and then the other question that um, this person asked, thank you for the question, by the way, um, was um, how do I communicate to the kids if there is a struggle and they, they had an argument or something, I will use their mother tongue. That's mm -hmm. not possible right then, because we need to solve something right now. Their emotional needs matter more than the language right then. But when I explain something to them, like a task to them, and I know that um, that my visuals that I can hold up or my gestures will help them understand, I will use that. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I might not use that anymore, and I might just say something in the foreign language I just said that this week as well and the child would look at me I, I thought I would just try it out without the gestures now let's see she didn't get it she looked at me puzzled <laughs> and then I would say the same thing again with the gestures and then she was able to understand so that's what I do and the second part of the question I think I that was do I do the lessons first in German or first in the mother tongue or the foreign language mm -hmm. the approach that we've chosen here also for the Montessori training, our foreign language module is not to do Montessori bilingual as in offering the Montessori material in the foreign language primarily. It's not that you can't do that, but the focus for us is on giving the kids the opportunity to express themselves and to choose what they would like to learn in the foreign language. And if somebody would like to do have a lesson um, on, I don't know what could I, on the time zones, I did that once with the kids, for example, um, of course, you could do that in English, but it's not that's for us. That's not the primary thing we do. It's something that can be added or when they're able, um, you could do that. But the primary thing is really to get them to interact and and to produce language that is meaningful to them, because first of all, the language is about us. It's a means of communication. So I get to communicate about me. Mm -hmm. And there's an iceberg model. I forgot the name of the person who came up with that. It takes so much time to be able to understand concepts in the foreign language. It's not like concepts like um, that have to do with with um, cosmic education in, in Montessori. Um, like when I, for example, geology or geography or whatever, it, it's really, really hard to understand that in the foreign language. 
It's not that we can't do that, but it's not the primary focus right there. First of all, it's about me and communicating about me. Right. Okay. And here's some more just straightforward questions. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Anka in Romania. If you as a guide speak mostly in the L2 and the child asks a question in their maternal language, which language do you respond in? I normally respond to in the foreign language and I might also recast what the child says. So mm -hmm. if a child says something in the mother tongue, I might say, for example, the girl who came up to me and he said, uh, and she said, um, can I can I also do the catch up on your conflicts book? Then I might say, oh, you would like to do the catch up on your conflicts book? Yeah, of course. So I recast, right? So they get provided with the forms that they can't say yet, but it's more a natural conversation than I keep on talking in the foreign language to them. Mm -hmm. Um, this is from Ava about the memory game. She asked, do they look up the words themselves or they extract them from magazines? Where do they find the words? They're it's, using? it's picture dictionaries and other dictionaries we have in the classroom and not just for elementary kids, because sometimes they want to learn words that are not in elementary school dictionary. So we also need bigger dictionaries in the classroom, but picture dictionaries and dictionaries that are for older kids are in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then they learn, I teach them how to look up words in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. But also they would come up to me when it's phrases. I mean, they can't just, you know, use individual words and put phrases together. It won't come out right. So they, so they come up and they say, how do I say that in English? And then I would, um, show that to them. Um, maybe um, I could show something in the slides that helps this question that you were just asking. That is, how do I scaffold language in the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, I just have to find the slide. And that is, we use posters for that. Posters where we collect language that the kids need. Um, let me just share my screen again. Um, hold on. This is also not my idea. This is Lini Dam's idea. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we have posters with language. And when you look at that poster, it looks very, very full. If I came up with a poster and I gave this to the kids, it would be too much. But for mm -hmm. example, we talked about, uh, I wanted to do a two minute talk with them about Christmas. And I asked them, what would you like to be able to say in the foreign language when you, when you talk about Christmas? So they would tell me what they would like to say in English. And then I would put it in English on the poster. And the poster stays in the classroom. But in a Montessori classroom, we don't put the posters on the walls everywhere. I have two posters normally on the English shelf and the other ones I copy and they're in a small folder. Um, so they can always go back and look up the words if they need. But for example, this poster stayed in the classroom then. And then I could see two girls laying down and making a memory game themselves. And they would lay down in front of the poster and then just copy what they wanted on there. Right. So this poster helps them. It scaffolds for them. But also I use small sticky notes and I just write it down for them. And they take the sticky note and then write it down on their game. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, Anne Claire in France asks if you have thought at all about these tools for three to six classroom as well. To be honest, I haven't yet. No, I know that, of course, the, the rhyme, like I'm big, I'm small, I'm short, I'm tall, you could do with them. Writing, I'm not sure, right? <laughs> to make their memory games, that's a little bit tricky. So I, to be honest... Yes. So, yes. No, I would also say that the developmental level of the three to six child, they don't have that same capacity for abstraction. They're mm -hmm. more doing things that are right in front of them. Um, the older children, yes, but um, not so much the younger three or four year olds. Um, Rochelle in Switzerland asks if you know the app Quizlet she, which she uses, it use, lets me choose words, definitions, and pictures. And I find it aware, a dynamic way to study for nine to 12 year olds. Beautiful. Have, have you heard of that app before? I yeah. have, but I've never used it myself, not yet. But I will we'll look into it again, I'll write it down. I came across it before, yes, um, yes. But thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. 
And Yasmina said, is the video um, project appropriate for beginners in L2? Like when I think of my classroom, right? They come as six-year-olds and then they, um, they don't know a lot in the foreign language. And like three years ago, I decided I'm only gonna start with a video project when they're in fourth grade, meaning they're nine years old. Now this year I decided I start one year early with the eight year olds. Um, that works perfectly fine, but of course their video will be less sophisticated. They will maybe only have 10 facts, but that's totally fine. When they're earlier, when they're younger than that, I haven't tried it out yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could work, but I think it really depends on the kids. And for us in Germany, we only have to offer foreign language starting in grade three. So before that, I just, yeah. Right. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and a follow-up question is from Yasmin is, where can we get by the materials Jana mentioned? Um, I don't know if Yasmina, if there was something in particular that you were interested in. Um, yeah, 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 I mentioned the book from, um, from, I think it's from your like mentors, yeah. tutors that, that, that did the autonomous learning. Uh, and then you mentioned yeah. the book in German, but the materials are in English. So that's what I'm referring to actually. Thanks. Yes, Annika, thank you, Yasmina. Um, it's, yeah, Annika Albrechts and Carmen Becker's book. It's from Helbling. And um, you can you can order it from from them. Helbling Helbling is the maybe I can put that in the chat. Um, Helbling is the um, the publisher, and their names are Carmen Becker and Annika Albrecht. And uh, maybe you could take a picture of the of the hold on where is it of the book for yourself so you could find it then and buy it. Hold on. I will just share my screen again and then here you are. So the one to the very right is the one. And the one in the middle is about language learning autonomy. This is where Lini Dan, um, the pioneer in learning autonomy, uh, contributed and also researcher David Little and Lena Liegenhaus, and that's in English. And this is a theory based, but it gives a lot of insight into how language learning autonomy works. And this is where Lini Dam also, this is where you find the ideas of the memory game and of documenting and evaluating and everything. And then there's a book in German <laughs> to the very left, which hopefully will be in English soonish for elementary school, which is very practical. So keep your, your eyes open for that. Hopefully that will come <laughs> in English. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there's a question from Pam, which is probably something we should have um, covered in the beginning just to give context. But Pam is wondering how many hours do you recommend per week of mm -hmm. you being in the classroom? And I think in your situation, it's, it's, it's already defined. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us how many hours you're in each classroom yes. per week? Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, so what we have, we have two Montessori guides per classroom, right? But they can't work full time. They can't be in the classroom all the hours of the week. So I go into the classroom and one of the Montessori guides go, goes outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the Montessori, I'm Montessori trained so I can also support the kids in other kind of work, right? So I will go into one classroom for one whole morning for three hours and one afternoon for two hours. Um, I did it before, which was less, where I went into the classroom twice a week for two hours. That worked as well. But of course, the more time you have with them, the more you can support them as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and if you are in the classroom and you're the Montessori guide yourself, well, you have all the opportunities to be very, very flexible, of course. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Are there any last questions before we wrap up for today? Uh, if I can, I, I really like the, the the ketchup on the cornflakes, but I didn't quite get what, what how so because there was a book right that you yes. guys read, yes. And how does the child do a book? Because the girl came to you and said, "Oh, I also want to do a book, ketchup on your cornflakes." So what is the concept? I mean, 
making the book or uncopying the words or what was the you know what what he, what is the the aim i mean the aim is to learn the language of course but like how is it what was the inspiration that this girl had from that book that i guess that's what i'm asking thanks i think i mean kids like to produce themselves right for sure and um like the aim here was to give them an opportunity to to make their own book yes to reproduce some of the kids would just choose to reproduce what was in the book but some kids then decide to go further than that and to include their own language and not talk about the words that are in there but then to ask a question do you like to make their own funny phrases and then they get to present that to other kids and read it together so it basically it's just a, an opportunity for them not to orally produce but to produce in writing reproduction and then maybe free production if they would like to as well and yeah so yeah, yeah. I think again it's just an example of how because I think the way you told that story was that you had actually read the book months before but the mm -hmm. months later that this child had the inspiration that she wanted to make something similar to the layout of the book and so I think it's also just the idea that children are are always taking in so much of what's happening every day um and we have to also trust in those processes don't we uh, mm -hmm. they're getting stimulated and it comes out sometimes when you don't expect it yes and maybe like how did did they get the inspiration also the other kids because there were many kids who made their own books right. like this went on for weeks that they made their own books so um it was a template i found i think on teachers pay teachers that i downloaded on catch up on your conflicts and it was basically you have the cover page which says catch up on your conflicts and then you just have a page that's divided in the middle mm -hmm. and then you can put the question on top and the answer like do you like catch up at the top conflicts at the bottom on your conflicts at the bottom and then you just cut the middle right mm -hmm. and that's basically what i what i gave to them this template and then they took that and made their own okay Yes. So and hold on one more thing <laughs> about this book is, of course, they would really like then to ask each other these questions, right? They would then flap through their books and not just read it, but then ask each other. It was also a matter of then communicating with each other and just having fun and laughing about it. So it was also something that engaged them in, in interaction with each other. Right. And again, the, the production opportunities that we're hoping to create. Yes. Um, so I'll just, I think I'll conclude with a comment from Anka in Romania. She says, Jana, your presentation is so full of love and passion for the work you're doing. It makes me want to become an L2 teacher in the elementary classroom. Mm. Anka, thank you so much. <laughs> so I think we could end on that note. That's a very beautiful note to end on. Um, the inspiration that you're providing other people. And thank you all for, for coming and being here with us today. Um, Do you mind if, if I have two slides that I would like to close with at some point? Oh, sure. Um, yes? Oh, sure, go ahead. Now is fine, yeah. Yes. And that is, hold on, or one slide actually. But um, yeah, I would just like to encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> to take your own steps in hold on how do I do that no go back <laughs> yeah to be brave and to take your own steps together with your children in your learning environment I don't know what your first step will be mm -hmm. and um yeah but enjoy that and if you have any questions you feel free to reach out and if you would like to learn more there is online teacher training to come and um you are welcome to follow me on Instagram um Jana's mindful stories. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And then I think we still have the question, right, that we would like to ask everyone at the end. Final question yes. that we always ask is, um, this is another mentee. We ask people to share what their yeah, aha moment was during the talk. Yeah. Expression of yourself, totally right. 
Mm. Skills already existing in the child. Yes, we don't just come with our brains, right? And then we have to perform or whatever. We bring our whole personality into the classroom. Yep, scaffolding, input, input, input. We're all learning. <laughs> oh, patience and passion, let's go hand in hand, yes. Mm, let the children tell you. Oh, I love your comments. This is so beautiful. <laughs> yes, yes. We have one more question that we would like to ask, and that is um, this one. If you were to take your first steps in language learning autonomy now, what would it be? Yeah, so you're going to use my my first step, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, of course, get inspiration from others as well. And small steps, I think. Yes, that's... towards more autonomy, yes. And as I said, you know, you could listen to Lini Dam. I did a workshop with her of one and a half days and another day, and I saw her so often, and still you don't dare to do everything at all at once. You still, it's okay. It takes time. Right. Step by step. Right. Follow an idea from a student. Ask them what they would like to do. Yes. Read up on some of the theory and at the same time go for it. Get out my French baby books and listen and learn more words. But making a memory game, yes. Input, input, input. Mm. yeah only what they need yes and we also do something which is called grammar on demand like I provide grammar only if it's needed by the task only if the kid wants to produce it maybe I could share that as well like within that 25 facts a boy would come up to me and then say how do I say his and her in English I don't know that because I haven't taught them well now he needs it and he's gonna ask and then he uses it right so it comes from the task mm -hmm. um right there as well um give authentic freedom of choice for the children get the courage to start the l2 can you scroll down a little bit thank you um not in a separate yes in the classroom bring the l2 into the classroom yay <laughs> yes yeah Bring resources in the environment so the children can access them freely. We're just working on uh, creating books. This is not my idea either. This is Birgitta Berger who did a community talk and um, I think a webinar now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and she uses a reading A to Z books in her classrooms and it's small books that are leveled and the kids can read them. So we're just producing that so the kids can also freely access those in the classroom. Yes, beautiful. Wonderful. Well, always put in mind that before we achieve such goals in learning, we must prioritize patiently the process. Yes. Mm, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. And whatever you put into practice, I would love to hear from you. Reach out. Let me know how it goes. If you have any questions, I would love to know. Oh, Mirka and your daughter. Hi. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Yana, for your very thoughtful and, um, yeah, your very thoughtful and passionate reflections on your work. I mean, it really is inspiring to listen to you. Um, so thank you. I'm so glad that you were able to come. And um, I'm thank sure- you. Thank you so much. <laughs> We'll have you back again because I know you have a lot more to share. <laughs> I would can I ask Yana, can I ask you? You mentioned that if anyone has questions to contact you. Yes. Is there through your Instagram or is there a different way you would like to I I would like to use Instagram for now. Um Okay. So uh, yes, Yana's mindful stories is my Instagram account. Yes. Great. All right. But thank you, Amy, for asking. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for this time that you've taken out of your time. Enjoy whatever you do in your classrooms and hopefully see you again sometime.